All right, let's just take a moment to breathe. All right, so sit comfortably. Pens and pencils down if your phone is looking at you. Flip it over. No, don't go. Sorry, I'll be right back. Sit up a little bit straighter than you would normally to get some nice, notionally fresh air into your lungs. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Otherwise, just look somewhere peaceful. And take a moment to arrive. So just start listening to the sounds around. Gradually bring your attention closer and closer. And start focusing on your breath. Notice how your body changes as you breathe. Notice that as you breathe in, the air is cool. As you breathe out, your chest and your belly expand and you relax. And three whole breaths, just focus on noticing your body as you breathe. And if your mind has wandered off, that's okay. Minds do that. Notice where it went and then bring it back. Two more breaths. One more breath. Just breathe. And then start listening to the sounds around. Wiggle your toes and your fingers. Give a stretch. Give a yawn if you need to, and open your eyes. Sorry. All right. So a lot of what we've done is immediately applicable to talking about triple integrals. The thing that is slightly trickier with triple integrals, so remember with double integrals, we spent a lot of time drawing the domain in the xy plane, and that's been quite straightforward. Um, but when you're doing a triple integral, you're actually integrating over a volume. So that's harder to draw. Um, and in fact, most times we don't really do that because it's just too painful. So. For me, at least, triple integrals end up being a much more mechanical kind of process. Um, I mean, sometimes I will draw cross sections to help my, me sort of visualize the space, but, but it becomes more mechanical. Um, but it is basically we're doing the same thing. So we're going to be integrating. So now we've got some function of x, y, z. So it takes in a point and spits out a number. And we're integrating it over a little volume, which is given by dx, dy, dz. So we're going from integrating over a little square like that to integrating over a little cube. We've got dx, dy, and dz. But the same rules apply. So in this one, we're integrating with respect to x first, then y, then z. But you can change your limits as you would with double integrals. Um, you'll be delighted to know that you can, in fact, do spherical coordinates. So we've just learned about polar coordinates. We can add another kind of spherical thing to give us spherical coordinates. In fact, you can do cylindrical coordinates. Um, you pick your coordinate system, you can, you can integrate. So yeah. So let's just have a look at one. Yeah. Sorry, can I just ask, so double integrals, they generate your volume, right? Yes. So what, what's the three integrals to, to get that? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It is, I mean, it's a, it is a volume in four space, I guess. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, it's a, yeah, 
I mean, if you, <laughs> I mean, you can think of a kind of a generalized idea of volume, as in in one in in one dimension, volume is a length. In two dimensions, it's an area. In three dimensions, it's the volume. In four dimensions, it's the four-dimensional thing. I wouldn't. I wouldn't stress too much about it. The the point is to be able to do these things. Um, Thank you. Okay, so let's let's give it a go. Okay, so so here we have so rectangular boxes we can totally draw. Okay, so this is fine. We can draw this one. So we're going to integrate this function. So note it as a function of x, y, and z. So z is no longer our dependent thing. Z is one of our coordinates. And here's our rectangular box. Let's give it a sketch. OK, so x goes from 0 to a. So our x is going from 0 to a. And our y is going from 0 to b. And our z is going from 0 to c. So if we turn that into a box, what we've got is something like that. So that is the volume. And what we're really doing is we want to sum up the value of that function at each of the points in the box. So that is really what we're doing when we take the integral. So we can put this all together. Uh, and at this point, it's not really going to make much difference who we integrate first, so I'm just going to keep it as dx, dy, dz. So then my limits become, I'm integrating from 0 to a, 0 to b, 0 to c. And now apart from the fact that we've got three things to do instead of two, um, it's all over bar the tiers. So integrating with respect to x first, so let's just keep my, uh, so my term over here x doesn't care about y's and it doesn't care about z's. It sees those as constants. So this is where it's worth kind of making a note for yourself. So if I integrate x times a constant, what do I get? I'm going to get a half x squared times the constant. What do I get if I integrate a constant with respect to x? x times the constant. OK. So apart from the fact that these things get a little bit hairy, integrating that from 0 to a. And if I plug those in, yay, the 0 is great. It takes care of two of the terms. So I'm going to get half a squared y squared plus a z cubed. so far. Okay, now I'm integrating with respect to y. So I've got a half a squared and now integrating y, that's going to give me a y cubed. And I need that to become a 6. And a z cubed y. Cubed. Almost done. And if you finish that up, enough with that. Okay. 
so so this was a pretty straightforward one because we didn't our our limits were all constants so we didn't have any additional x's and y's moving through but you get the basic process um, any questions so again once you're feeling comfortable with double integrals I think you'll find that moving on to triple integrals isn't really that big a deal. And we will talk a little bit about changing orders of integration, but, but as far as I'm concerned, if you go out into the big wide world and you have to change the orders of integration on a triple integral, um, you, have the, you have the basic knowledge of how to do it. Um, you can go and figure it out. So we're not going to spend a lot of time because a lot of it is really just, it's like three times the amount of work, which is not helpful. There's no, there's no, there's no additional insight from changing the limits for three for triple integrals that you get beyond two. Does that make sense? So I'm not going to ask you a lot of that. OK, in fact, that's all I'm really going to say about triple integrals. So you will do some in the tutorials. Um, but I would never ask you to draw anything other than a, a cube. <laughs> OK, I'm not going to ask you to draw some complicated thing um, in a test or exam. Okay, so let's, let's just see how far we've come, and we really have come very far in three and a half weeks. So we started out by looking at vector-valued functions of one variable. So that was where we were looking at, for example, mapping the motion of something in three-dimensional space. So there you were putting in a single number, you're putting in a scalar, but you were getting out a vector. It feels like a very long time ago, but it was only three weeks. Okay, so that, that gave us all these ideas of like paths and describing paths using vectors and things like that. And then we moved on to chapter 13, where now we have scalar valued functions of a vector, so of several variables. So here, we'd switch things around, and basically we were putting a vector into the function and we were getting out a scalar. So that's what we've been just integrating these kinds of things. So we were integrating <coughs> f of x, y, or f of x, y, z. Okay. And now what we need to have a look at is vector-valued functions, where we take a vector, we put it into a function, but what it spits out is another vector. Why, you ask, would we do something as insane as that? Well, it turns out that if you want to describe gravity, you need to do exactly that. Because if you want to describe gravity at a point, you put in the point, and what you need to get out is a vector, because gravity is a force. So anytime you want to make a link between a position and a force, you need these bunnies. So that's basically all of physics. But a lot of what we've used so far is going to help us with this. So now what we're looking at, chapters 15 and 16, are these. And this is going to take us the final step to where we need to go to be able to understand Maxwell's equations. All right, are you ready? So, how, so it's been, I mean, it's been getting increasingly difficult to visualize functions as we go along. Um, three dimensions is about what we can do. And now I've just said, I've got a function where I put in a vector and I get out a vector. Like what even? So the way that we, we visualize these things so a function whose domain and range are both vectors, in this case R3, is called a vector field. Um, for anyone who studied other branches of maths where you've learned about fields, it's not the same field. So it's a completely different field. OK. I think, I think I read somewhere that it's called a field because basically if you plot these things as vectors, it kind of looks like maybe a field of like wheat and stuff. But that might just be apocryphal. OK, so we're putting in a vector, getting out a vector. The only way that we can usefully plot this is in some ways to look at various points that we're interested in and plot the vector at that point that we get. So for example, if I look at my function f of x, y, z, which is, so I put in an x, y, z, and it spits out a vector that looks like that. What do those vectors look like? Well, if I look at the point, 
zero. Where am I? Okay, I might have got the axis slightly wrong, but if I look at the point zero, zero, there's nothing. As I move out along the x-axis, I'm getting little vectors pointing along the x-axis. Anywhere else, I've got a vector that's pointing in the xyz direction that is proportional to where I am. So the further away I get, the longer my vector is. Okay, don't stress too much about it. It was just to give you kind of an idea of what a vector field looks like. And we usefully kind of, we split our vector field up. It's not super useful having it written as f of x, y, z. We split it up into the x, y, and z components. And each component has a, a coefficient which is itself a function of probably the three variables. Okay, so each one of these <coughs> over here is one of the bunnies that we've just been studying, a function which takes in a variable and spits out one number. So for example here, it's pretty straightforward. Here you put in an x, and whatever x you put in, you get out a number, and so on. Yeah? But that will be a function of the three variables. So if you have, for example, yes. x so I, z. Yes. So I just kept a simple one, but there's no reason we couldn't have, for example, x squared plus 2yz. Okay. So we, because often we are working in two dimensions instead of the three that we've just talked about. So if we have um, just f as a function of x and y, so we're only working in the x, y plane, we call this a plane vector field because it's living in the plane. And a picture of one of those would be something like that. And you can immediately start seeing why you might have what's called a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I mean, the, the thing to remember here is we're, we're only plotting at, diff at, at individual points. So this is not like when we draw a whole surface and we're plotting for all the points. Here, we've picked a grid of points, and at each point, we're plotting the little vector that lives at that point to try and build up some idea of what this thing looks like. So one annoying thing to note in both of these is up to now when we had a subscript of one we were referring to take the derivative of the in the first variable now that does not mean that it means this is the coefficient of the first variable this is not a derivative so here so in fact what they just said here components not partial derivatives there will be partial derivatives don't worry they're coming. Um, <laughs> but we'll use other notation for them. OK. And the same thing is happening over here. So just so that you've heard the terminology, a scalar value function of a vector variable, so the things we've been looking at, where you put in a vector and you get out a scalar, is frequently called a scalar field, just to differentiate it from the vector fields that we've just had. So in fact, the components of the vector field are each scalar fields. So each of these things here is a scalar field. And I don't know why they called it a field, but they do. But the key thing is it's a scalar. So you put in a vector, you get out a scalar. Okay, so why do we love these things? <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, apart from the fact that clearly they're awesome, um, they turn out to be really, really useful. So they allow us to describe gravity, which is quite handy if you're going to do physics. Uh, they help us describe basically everything in electromagnetism, also handy, useful. Um, if you're trying to do any kind of velocity, if you've got a moving fluid, vector fields. Um, and then this, which is going to turn out to be super important, if you find the gradient 
of a scalar field, remember when we found the gradient, the gradient gives you a vector. So in fact, the gradient is a vector field. You just didn't realize. Okay. And it's going to be super useful, this link between taking a scalar field, taking its gradient and getting a vector field is going to be a very, is a very powerful link between the two. And it also means that quite often, if you were lucky, because there's this link between the two, you can work with the scalar field, which is much easier to work with, but be finding out stuff about the gradient. I mean, about, about the linked vector field. So, so as you'll see quite shortly, there's a link between scalar fields and their gradients, which are vector fields. And unit radial and unit transverse vectors are examples of vector fields in the xy plane, which you might have realized. Um, but you can think about those. Um, you can think about, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Okay, so these things are super useful. I hope that, that gives you some justification for pushing through um, for the rest of the course. We will be working a lot with these bunnies. Okay, so let's, let's have a look at an example. So for those of you who are not doing physics, I apologize. Um, but, you know, gravity works for you too, so. Um, okay, so if you have a point mass sitting somewhere um, and you want to find the gravitational field at some point, point, so you've got a point mass sitting at R0 and you want to know what is the gravity due to that point mass at some other point R away, I'm just telling you, I'm not proving this, but it turns out that it's given by this. So uh, you have a mass m, some constant, which we don't really care about because we're doing maths, not physics. And we've got this equation over here where we've got some vectors coming in. So notice that everything over here gives us a scalar, that's just kind of a, a scaling function. And this over here will give us a vector. So overall, we have a scaled vector here. All right. And the question that you might ask is, what does this look like? Well, let's just look in the plane. Um, so here is my, I put my, my point mass over here, and I want to know what is the force that I experience if I'm over here? Well, it's that much. It's pulling me towards there. But notice that the further away that I get from my point, it's getting smaller, which is what we all experience with gravity. OK, so this looks like it's not inconceivable. Um, and you can imagine what this would look like if we were in three dimensions. It would just be a whole lot of little vectors all pointing towards your point mass with their length getting smaller the further away you are. OK. so at least plausible. <laughs> so the vectors, the little vectors that we've been drawing are quite helpful. But sometimes what is also helpful is to draw in what we can think of as, well, we call them field lines, but they are uh, trajectories for the given vector field where, okay, let me just read properly what it's saying over here. So essentially what we want to do is instead of just drawing our little vectors, we're thinking about what would happen. You can, so think about this now as a velocity. So this is showing the, the vectors are showing the velocity of some fluid. And you might want to think about what trajectory would a little particle take if it was in this moving fluid. And so you could start at one point, for example, over here, and you could follow each of the little vectors and end up with the path that your little particle would take. More generally, so if we're not thinking about a velocity field, you would want to think about field lines, if you're thinking about a magnetic field, things like that. But again, it's this idea of if you start at one point in the vector field, where will the vector field take you? Whatever your vector field is. So this gives us the idea of mostly, I've heard them called field lines, but also trajectories, integral curves. Um, and sometimes, 
in a force field, you would think of them as your lines of force. Okay, so that's just a kind of a little bit of background. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here. Um, so our field lines don't depend on the magnitude, only the direction. So they're, so if you're thinking about a little particle that's bobbing along due to a field, um, we're not, we're just saying what path does it follow, not how fast it's going. Um, so we're just thinking about the direction. And we can actually use what we know about parametric equations. So if our field line, which is a line in th three-dimensional space, so we can have a parametric equation for it, then it's tangent to, sorry, it's tangent, it's tangent vector must be parallel to the force. So all we're really saying, if you look at this picture over here, is that if we look at our field line at any point, its tangent must be parallel to the vector at that point. Nothing particularly crazy. So this says, so here is our, our tangent vector. We know that the tangent vector for a parametric curve is this thing. And we've just said that it must be parallel to our force at that point. Being parallel means that you are some multiple of that. So we have this equation over here. How does this help us? This helps us because, in fact, this is an equation that we could solve. It's a differential equation. We're not going to do a lot of it. But one thing that you can do when you're trying to understand different vector fields is to calculate the field lines, and that will give you a picture of what is actually going on in your field. Make sense? OK, you don't need to know this. But essentially, we can break. So remember, this is a vector equation. Break it into three components. What's happening with dx, dy, and dz. And then you could integrate each of these to find out your field lines. And again, so this is just for interest. Okay, just so that you have an idea of where we head from here, we will talk a little bit about the vector field in polar coordinates, because the example that we've just seen over here, um, is much more straightforward, as you can see straight over here, if you're thinking in terms of r and theta, because you're in a spherically symmetric thing, you don't want to be working in x, y, and z. You want to be working in r and theta and phi, which is the next dimension. So we're going to talk about polar coordinates. And then we're going to talk <coughs> about conservative fields. And these kind of firm up this idea between vector fields and scalar fields. And how we saw that if you take a scalar field and you take its gradient, then you get a vector field. And this makes the, a very important link for the kinds of things you want to work with. All right, good job, everybody. I will see you on Thursday, if not before.